We'd like to have you if it's God's will for you to thank, come. Thank you, Brother. God bless you. Thank you very much. The Lord bless you, friends. Thank you, and you be seated just a moment. It always makes me feel good to, to feel welcome. Uh, that's kind of a, I'm a Kentuckian myself, you know, and I, I like to hear that making you welcome. And uh, such a nice welcome to this city and among you, my Christian friends, certainly makes me feel grateful to you. And always by Brother Rogers, I, I love him. He's uh, been a wonderful little brother to me and how he's certainly been a real tool in God's hand here in Owensboro. I was just looking across the street there where you're going to build a new church or something over there that he was telling me about this morning at the breakfast table. And that's wonderful, seeing you, you progress like that. That just shows that you're, you're backing up the right thing and God's servant is uh, trying his best to give the best he can to God's people. Uh, every congregation appreciate a pastor like that that you see what your finances, your tithes, your offerings, and so forth, you are, he's going straight into the kingdom of God to and better the kingdom of God. Make a better place, not for himself, for you. He, he's got the sheep on his mind. The shepherd always has. While in Palestine, or over in the Orient, rather, I often wondered on the parable of the Bible, the parables, rather, of the Bible, what some of them meant. And uh, you almost have to go into the Orient to find out what this Bible really means. Once I have, I've sat down, and many of us as, as Western ministers has um, pondered over the thought, what did they mean by this? What did this mean? And what did that mean? And if you ever go to the Eastern country and see their unchanging uh, habits, well, then you find out more about the Bible. It become a new book to me after I went to the East. For instance, like Jesus said, I believe in St. John 10, I think, I am the door to the sheepfold. I am the door to the sheepfold. I often wondered how that, that meant, that he stood at the gate and received all the people as they come in, or I thought maybe the shepherds stood and numbered the sheep when they come in like that. That's, I used to think that. And perhaps many of you, my brethren, clergymen, have thought the same thing. But once there, you find out that there, it's a difference. It isn't uh, the numbering of the sheep, but the shepherd himself becomes the door. There's a crowd, like a place with a shelter over it. And um, he brings in all the sheep and puts them in there. Then he goes and lays down across the door. And the sheep or the wolf can't come in, or the sheep go out without crossing the shepherd. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. See, he is the door to the sheepfold. See, nothing can come to the sheep unless the shepherd permits it. And if we got the shepherd at the door, how secure and, and happy should we be? Satan can't touch you unless the shepherd permits it. And it's all for the good, whatever it has to be. See what I mean? And that's when you said, I noticed again, and the shepherd, in this country, shepherd doesn't mean very much. Well, it's some ancient word. But over there, shepherd, oh my, and sheep. The people live by their sheep. And the shepherd uh, takes care of them. One time while going through the country, I noticed in the far east uh, of, uh, of the little uh, in India how that they had uh, a shepherd came down and was bringing his sheep. And he, I thought of that parable there where he said, My sheep know my voice. A stranger they will not follow. Now, that sheep was born under the tutorship of this shepherd. He learns that voice. He'll never pay attention to anybody else's voice. He learns that shepherd's voice. Another shepherd might call, 
They might do whatever they want to, but there's some little something about that shepherd that the sheep recognizes. See, that's the way it is with God's sheep. Strange voices, they just don't sound right. They just won't go, that's all. And a sheep can be tempted, but when it finds out that it's the wrong shepherd, we'll turn away. And I notice how the sheep follow the example of the shepherd. Coming down through the street, where there was a little narrow streets, the streets in the eastern countries there were made in the days of chariots, when they had the chariots that went through the street and horse riders. And they're very narrow, very seldom you find one as wide as them post there, very seldom. Sometimes maybe all 12 feet wide, the street. Man, the, or the, or like in Oslo, Norway, the street there is only about eight foot across in the old city. It's around 1,500 years old. And then uh, you find out they didn't have automobiles in this modern age where they shuffle and jostle through the broadways. See, Nahum called them broadways. And then standing on the outer drive in Chicago, I've thought of that many times, how the uh, three and four abreast going each way, the broadways, and the elevation of the separation of the streets in the middle, how they press the button in a place. And for several miles, a uh, rail will rise up like this to separate your traffic at different times of the evening and at different times of the day. Broadways. In them days, one of those lanes would have been a complete highway. But seeing this shepherd come down to the city, it was, uh, it was alarming. There come a whole string of sheep following him. Now, the Easterners put all their dainties out on the street. Even their meats and everything else lays on the street, and all their fruit and their pro produce lays right on the street. Just like, here's their store, like here they keep their stuff back in there, but you buy right off of the side of the walk. And there's no sidewalk, it's just the street. So everybody walks right in the street, just right down the street, the cobblestone street. And here come a shepherd down the street walking, walking along, and behind him a string of sheep a city block long. And them sheep walking right by that produce and things and wouldn't turn right or left. They kept their eyes on the shepherd, moving right on through. I thought, oh, God. <laughs> what the shepherd means? Not look right or left. Not be tempted by this or that. But walk in the footsteps of the shepherd. They want to follow the shepherd. I noticed one day while we were in a little British jeep riding around, there's a shepherd had a whole lot of... A, animals up on the hill there he was feeding them they were leading them and taking them places and in there he had sheep in there he had goats in there he had mules had camels everything he was feeding them all it was all grazing the shepherd was watching him i said my shepherd here means many things well, i said a shepherd is a grazer but said you know the strange thing it is mr branham he said when nighttime comes you watch that all those sheep go right straight to the shepherd. Said the mules will stay out in the pasture. And said the camels will stay out in the pasture. But said and the goats will stay out in the pasture. But said the sheep all come straight to the shepherd when it comes nighttime. Why? Said because the sheep are put up at night and kept safe. I said, Mister, don't talk like that. You make me start shouting right here in the middle of the road. See? Night times are coming. Many are grazing on the same thing, but only the sheep will he recognize. See what I mean? Just the sheep, the born again. Many are called, few are chosen. Oh, I love him today, don't you? Let us speak to him now before we open his word. Our Heavenly Father, we come to Thee on this Sabbath day, raining on the outside. Me, we might call it gloom, hazy, rainy weather. But how could the farmer put in his crops if we didn't have much moisture this spring? There would be no fruit food raised, ground would be dry, people would perish. We realize that this is like experience of a Christian. Sometimes we have to go through 
terrible chastisement, chastening of the Lord. Many things to correct us that we'll be fruit-bearing Christians. Sometimes has to prune us, cut off, take away, take out of our hands. We think sometimes, oh God, what are you doing to us? But he knows what he's doing. So we pray, Father, that today that you'll prune every one of us. From the least to the greatest, the pastor. God, we pray that you'll prune every one of us. Take away all that's unlike you, Father. Take away the thing that's hindering us from being fruit-bearing Christians. The day is coming when it's going to get dark, and then we want to go into the sheepfold. We want to be sheep today, Father. We want to follow exactly in the footsteps of the shepherd. He gave us his example, said, I come not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. May that be our motive today, God, to do the will of God who has saved us. Bless the church today in the Sunday school throughout the entire world. And remember us, Lord, this little spot here in Owensboro today that you will pour out your blessings upon us, for we're needy and hungry and thirsting for righteousness. Thy promises, it shall be filled. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In these services, a visit to me with Brother Rogers, which is always a great uh, privilege to come and to meet with Brother Rogers and you dear saintly people here in other churches through Owensboro and the cities around about. I've learned this, that no matter if he's Chinese, Japan, Korean, German, whatever he is, as long as he's a brother or she's a sister, there's not a bit of difference in him. They're just all sheep of the same fold watching it through the different nations throughout the world have come this you get into a communistic country where I've had to be I've had to have people with rifles to keep the crowds back and I've had to have people that with soldiers that I'd have to duck my head down and mill around me to keep them getting shot till they get me out into somewhere into the darkness where they couldn't see to shoot me at and things like that preaching the gospel bringing good tidings of great joy of the Lord Jesus Christ and then it's, it's marvelous to know that Jesus, in the midst of all of that, is just as sweet and good, dear. It just, there's nothing alarming about it, just taking a message. And today it's our privilege to be here with you and at the sports center this afternoon, or this evening, rather, for the service. We pray that you'll all find a place. If your own church is not having service, why be out to visit with us. And we'd be glad to do all that we can to help you, to make burdens a little lighter, make the community a little better place to do right, a little easier, and a harder place to do wrong. That's what the, the meetings are intended. Now today, as we're just going to speak a little, I have a, a very bad voice, and, and I'm, I've got a vision in my heart. And I thought this morning at Sunday school, just before the, uh, the coming forth of the preaching this afternoon, and if God willing, today, the, this afternoon, I want to speak on a very, uh, or this evening, rather, a very uh, outstanding uh, scriptures concerning the time that we're living. And I believe by God's help, the subject, I probably will approach it from a different way than the first one, the first message that I preached after the great visitation of the Holy Spirit a few weeks ago. And I thought, being that we were together this morning, just as a little group of Christians here, that we would talk just heart to heart with one another a while. And I know that down in every man's heart, there's something that yearns to see the supernatural. Here not long ago, I was sitting in California in a meeting, wearing a hairpiece on top of my head and wearing a pair of dark glasses just to listen at a brother's theology, because they'd recognize me if it wasn't. I sat with people right next to them, and they didn't even know me. Just sitting there, 
just see, look around, even hear them talk about me. They didn't know it was me. <laughs> just sat there. And I happened to be sitting by a man with his collar turned around. There was a minister come to the platform, and the man's one of my converts to divine healing. But he, he'd preach a while, and he'd go back, and a valet would change his clothes when he get a little sweaty and come back out again on the platform. And this great man sat there shaking his head. He looked over to me and said, Does that act like a servant of Christ? I said, I am not the judge. I said, he said, uh, Well, I said, I think his message is wonderful. He said, uh, Are you a Christian? I said, Yes, sir, I am. And he said, uh, Well, he said, Do you think a servant of Christ should just put on a whole lot like that and dress like that and act like that? And I said, Well, you see, to my opinion, God has people in different categories to catch people that live in different categories. He's talking about, said, Well, the man has two Elvarados every year. I said, I'm very thankful that God's that good to him. See? And uh, so he looked down at me kind of strange and he said, um, are you a Christian? I said, I'm a minister. He said, uh, my name is so-and-so, and I said, my name is Branham. He said, you wouldn't have to be the Branham that uh, prays for the sick? I said, yes, sir. Oh. He said, I see. And he could see why I was taking up for this other brother. And he said, uh, Mr. Branham, he said, uh, aren't you a Baptist? I said, I was, yes, sir. He said, I want to ask you something. He said, I am a certain doctor of theology and a certain church, well, a, a Presbyterian. And he said, you know what? On this West Coast here, he said, we Presbyterian people had the entire coast sewed down. He said, we had the biggest churches, the finest congregations of any churches on the West Coast. And said, you know what broke us up? I said, no, sir. He said, that cult, Christian science, come in and broke up our church. And said, now, this Pentecostal group's coming in and breaking up Christian science and everything. I said, mm-hmm. I said, doctor, do you know hungry children will eat from a garbage can? Is there a hungry? <laughs> he said, well, I guess that's right. I said, if you Presbyterians, as you said you were, if you would have stayed with the Word of God and give the children the bread of life, that cult would have never broke them up. I said, you just let down, that's all. <laughs> and I said, people are still people, and they're, every man is trying to look beyond the curtain. He's trying to see where he come from and where he went to. And if the church of the living God won't produce it, then the devil will rise up some cults to give him some false things. I said, therefore, you ought to stay with the word of God that all been Presbyterians. And that's right. Truly. And that's the way I think generally the feeling of people are. Now, I want to read a little text of scripture here. And... Um, Maybe the Lord had his blessings to it, and I'll lay my watch out because I know your Sunday school classes will be adjourning pretty soon, and we have some after service. And I thought I'd just talk to you just, just heart to heart a little bit this morning in the Sunday school lesson. And we find this just across the page from where I preached last night from Second Kings. This is uh, Second Kings, the fifth. Now, listen at the fourth verse. And it was so when Elijah... The man of God heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes. He sent unto the king and said, So you rent your clothes. Come to me and know there is a prophet in Israel. Now, the thing we want to talk on this morning for a little while is the supernatural. We're all hungry for supernatural. You Methodist brethren are hungry for supernatural. I got a Methodist preacher with me that's hungering and thirsting for the supernatural. You Baptists are hungering and thirsting for supernatural. All of them are. 
Now, surely, if God is still God, he's still supernatural. Don't you believe that? He's got to be. Now, we're trying to place God in some prehistoric or some historical God, but well, what good does a historical God do today? What benefit is the God of Elijah to a man today if he isn't the same God? Amen. What are you learning about him in the seminary? Well, if he was some historical fact and not the same today, you'd be better to learn agriculture or something, or something would help somebody. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. You'd be better off if you learned to, your children to be an architect instead of a minister. If he's a historical God and not the same today, what good does the God of Moses do to a man today if he isn't the same God today? Just reason that in your mind now. We are so in, so always concerned about our experiences. A little lady told me last night, which is in our midst today, her father, a, a preacher of a certain great denomination of church. And I asked her, did her father ever pastor so-and-so? And she said, Brother Branham, my father only had... Uh, a grammar school education. Therefore, they would not permit him in bigger churches because his education was too poorly. Perhaps a fine, spirit-filled man, but the organization would not promote him, no matter how spirit-filled he was, because of uh, an inadequate education. There they miss God. Peter couldn't even sign his own name. And he had the keys to the kingdom of God given to him by Jesus Christ. Amen. We're looking to education. Education's fine, but that's taught in schoolhouses. The church is a place to know of God and learn of God yes. and in the supernatural. And God is a, a supernatural and the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, we want to, to see and place this before our, our audience. That, that God still is the same that he ever was. The people get away from God, but God remains the same. His, his nature and his power and his desire is always the same through every generation. It ever changes. It's always the same. It's the people that get away from God and not God from the people. They lose their faith. God covers all space, all everywhere. He's omnipresent. So he's everywhere, and he's always has been everywhere, and he always will be everywhere. But it's the attitude of the people that brings the result. That's the reason that at Pentecost they had to go to an upper room and pray until the Holy Ghost came because they got in one place and one accord. It's the atmosphere what brings the result. You believe that? Let every man and woman in this building this morning, boy or girl, get everything from their mind but the Lord Jesus and believe that he's standing present right now and you'll see something happen that will cause headlines in the newspaper in the morning. Right? It's atmosphere. I don't believe in joking from the pulpit because the pulpit's no place to joke. It's a sacred place. I'm quoting something just to, for this here. Mr. Bosworth, very good sense of humor. And he said, Brother Branham, to prove that it's atmosphere, said you could take a hen egg and put it on a, under a puppy and tie him down and it would hatch a chicken. See, it's the warmth of the puppy's body that would hatch the egg. It don't have to be under the hen. It can be under the puppy. It could be in an incubator. It's the atmosphere. And it's the atmosphere that brings... Uh, miraculous and wonders and powers of God among the people. It's the atmosphere of the people. And when people get to a place, they're reasoning and wondering and stewing and thinking and all tore up, don't know where they do stand, half of them not even scripturally taught. How can you expect the atmosphere to be right? You can't do it. It won't be right. It's got to be in one accord, one place, and settle down with one motive, one thing. Then you're going to see something happen. It don't only work that, but if you look at it in a scientific world. Say you're all a bunch of salesmen and we're going to sell 
Chevrolets or Pontiacs or some kind of a car. And one in his heart really thinks the Studebakers are better and so forth like that. Get us all together and send the Buick is the best and the other and some other car. Get us together like that. You can never have a right kind of a meeting. Take it in the devil's work. Go over and say we're going to a dance. One man standing up and saying, well, now he, he don't know about where he wants to dance or not. And this girl over and she this, that, and the music's playing near my God to thee. <laughs> what an atmosphere for a dance. Well, that's not any different than what a lot of atmospheres you go into church for a service of God. Just that contrary. That's right. The only thing to bring the rap atmosphere then for the dance is to put on their old music that makes dances and everybody gets thinking what a good time they're going to have dancing and so forth and they'll be having their big hoop up in time. Put the right kind of a music on the piano, the organ, and everybody in the atmosphere that Jesus Christ is there and go to meet everything that they have need of, something will go taking place. Atmosphere. But that's the hardest thing there is to do. And that is to get people in that atmosphere. The atmosphere of worship. The atmosphere of believing. And that's the reason that sometimes a divine life that's been called and set aside has become a fanatic or crazy or, or a mystic or something to the eyes of the general public. It's because you're considered a, 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 a I'd say, a neurotic or a insane person is because that you have changed your dwelling place and got into a different atmosphere. And your one motive, your one thought is to stay in that atmosphere. And any person that ever come into that atmosphere one time will never be satisfied nowhere else. And that's why I believe that we should have our churches under control by the Holy Ghost. That man and women in their work and wherever they should be should continually desire, and they will, if they've ever once come into that atmosphere. Now, Ben, I'm speaking in the assembly of God, church, amongst Pentecostal people. Now, I've learned to love the Pentecostal people. They're my brothers and sisters. But many times we find in our own ranks of Pentecost that sometimes our atmosphere becomes an emotion instead of a worship. And that soon dies out and the members become one thing and another. But if we could ever get a group of people together to work with genuine Holy Spirit atmosphere of sacredness and sincerity and worship, and the men and women sitting in there are God conscious and know that the great omnipotence of God is present, ready to do all things without one shadow of doubt, they'll even have an effect upon the unbelievers that's sitting in the seat. You can never come into that atmosphere without something happening. I was preaching here not long ago. The tape recorders here, the boys is with me. They took a sermon on the hidden life of Christ, how to get into Christ, and how that some people have ups and downs. They can't. There's a place you have to find. The outer courts produce manna, sure. Many people are living right in that manna. They eat in the manna, but they don't live the right kind of a life. They're up and down. They have ins and outs and bad days and good days. But you've met people that absolutely, no matter what the weather was or what the conditions was, they're on the housetop all the time. He found that secret. He found an atmosphere to live in. In the Old Testament, how that the congregation was fed from bread out of heaven. They live in three different atmospheres. In the court, in there the manna fell. And the Israelites eat manna. He eat the same manna they did at every other place. Same manna. But remember that inside the course in the ark was a place fixed where the, the manna never did get old. Otherwise, it got old. It wouldn't last till 9 o'clock in the morning if it didn't grind it up into meal and make some cakes out of it and eat it. And we find out before the sun went down, they were hungry if they didn't gather enough. And that's what's the matter of the people today. They got the campground cramped. They go to a revival and have a great time. 
The first thing you know, a little after that, before another revival could come along, they're back in the world again. A certain man wrote an article about me not long ago, which is perfectly all right. I love him. I don't say that to be a hypocrite. I say it because it's the truth. John Church, you Nazarene people, man. He said, he wrote against divine healing. He said, one of their key men, Mr. Branham, said, I've never met the man in my life. And to think of a sensible man writing an article about a person he had never spoke to in his life. That shows me something wrong. Our law says, how can we judge a man without we hear him first? He said, I don't know the man, never, heard, never seen him in my life, but a, a man come to me and told me that he was setting, he wanted me to pray for him, that he would be healed of a prostrate trouble. And he said, I was healed once. And said, he told me the story. He said, I was sitting in a meeting and said, uh, way back in a balcony and said, it's Mr. Branham's meeting and said, all at once I began to feel a strange feeling come over me. And said, then the man turned around from where he was preaching and said, the man sitting up there is so-and-so, a certain man from a certain place. And said, he's praying that he'll be healed of a prostrate trouble. And said, if he'll only accept it and believe it now, he can go home and be well. He said, something struck me. I never felt anything like it in my life. He said, and for a solid year, my prostrates never bothered me, and it come on me again. Mr. Church said, then, don't you see? That shows that Mr. Branham is false. If God healed a man, he'd heal him for life. I thought, Mr. Church, how many times you come up on the Silver Hills campground and get all those Nazarenes sanctified this year, next year you sanctify another bunch of them. Maybe they didn't have it to begin with, then God wouldn't be real. See? Divine healing and sanctification and the powers of God is as long as your faith lasts in it. When your faith fails, then your experience is gone. It's based that way simply upon the finished works of Christ the Calvary. You're sanctified as long as your testimony is right, as long as you live a sanctified life and believe that God sanctifies you, you're sanctified. Amen. Count it all to His grace and His merit. And as long as you can accept healing and believe your healing and, and go on and believe it like that, you'll be healed as long as you believe it. And you start doubting it, and you take a, a man sitting here this morning that's not a bit sick and let him begin to get in his heart, believe it, he is sick, they'll pack him out of the building. As your faith is, so be it unto you. That's not Christian science. I'm not meaning mind over matter. But you see, the thing of it is, it's the atmosphere that you live in. Now, this man that we're going to speak of for just a few moments, then I want to give you a testimony. This man, Elijah, the great prophet, was a man who lived in that constant atmosphere. He was a call man, a Nazarite birth. All gifts and callings are without repentance. It's nothing you can't make one hair black or white. You can't add one cubic to your statue. We only have carnal impersonation when we try to impersonate something that God hasn't made us. If we try to do something that God hasn't called us to do, we'll be a total failure doing it. If man would try to make himself woman, woman, man, how would you do it? I met that woman that was supposed to have the surgical test and be made, or man made a woman, whatever it was, in Italy, in Rome. There she was, a disgrace to being a woman. Drunk as she could be walking up and down the streets and all oh, harvest sights you ever seen. Notice. You can't make yourself anything different from what God intended you to be. Anything else is an impersonation. Therefore, if your conversion is only because you're trying to hide behind something or trying to make yourself a better person, you're only playing the part of a hypocrite until Christ has actually come to your life and changed you and brought you into an atmosphere. That's the difference of it. That's the reason we go through so many different farms and saying they have to do this. Jesus said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life. Not a make-believe, it's absolutely something that's happened. 
and in conversion of the heart that's changed you and brought you into another realm. Men are misunderstood. Christian women, men, boys and girls are misunderstood who live in those places because it's contrary to the natural run of life among people of the world. And I'm sure we all want to live in that atmosphere. Look, the people who eat the manna out here on the ground was eating the same manna that the high priest eat in under the Shekinah glory. But this manna withered away out on the ground, but that in the hidden place never did wither away. It lasted through the spans of years. And a man who walked in there, when a high priest went in beyond that veil, that veil that separated the holies from the holies of holies, when he walked in there, the veil dropped behind him. That man, he it was even soundproof. He didn't even shut off from all the world and the surroundings. He knew nothing in there but the living in the presence of God. And a man or a woman that ever walked into that Shekinah glory of God, the whole world shut off behind him. No matter what the devil says, you don't pay any attention to it. And he's living in a different atmosphere. He lived in there where they put Aaron's rod. And it was nothing but an old dead stick off of an olive tree. But once laid in the presence of God, it yielded what it was supposed to be in the beginning. And one night's time, it budded, blossomed, and brought almonds. That's the same way that an unbeliever or a sinner is ever laid in the presence of Almighty God under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He becomes a new creature right then. His life becomes fruitful, fresh. Life comes in. And he yields what he was supposed to be, a son of God. We were tuck off of the tree, so was that olive branch. He was tuck off of a tree, but sinners and, and lukewarm church members become dry sticks. With some kind of a memory that sometime there was a supernatural God in the past, they had life and way back there. But if you believe and lay in his presence, it'll produce the same thing to you. You will realize that you were born sons and daughters of God and will yield the fruit of the Spirit. But you can't do it out there in the courts. You've got to do it in here. On the inside, hid away. The man out in the courts, he walked by daylight. Some days it was like this, rainy. Other days it was sun and shine, the night time to be dark and stormy. He had his ups and downs. That's the way you see people. Oh, they say, we're eating the good man of God. That's right. But where are they living? They're living out there eating it in an atmosphere that they should not eat it in. The next man, he had another light. That's the man at the altar. It was lit by seven golden candlesticks, some little lamps. And sometimes them lamps burnt low. And they smoked up the gl- chimneys. And you know how a lamp does. Smokes and goes out. And a man who comes to the place where he comes into the church, out of the courts, out of the, just a lukewarm church member, and comes up to live a pretty good new life in Christ, he's separating things from the... But he's still living under lights that will get dim and smoke up and artificial light. But when he once walked in behind that holiest of holies, Walked into the presence of God and the veil falls behind him. There's a pot of man at work and eat every day, every hour of the week. There's where he's living in the Shekinah glory, where in the interlocked wings of the cherubims, the great pillar of fire and the Shekinah rested there and he's living under there. He can't be nothing but a real genuine Christian anytime. Atmosphere. Men and women who live in there are misunderstood. You see it? They become peculiar. They don't hear the things of the world. If they do, they don't pay attention to it. They just move on. God never put that in there for nothing. God never come for just any haphazard way. Prayer is not a, a perhaps. Prayer is a sincere thing. Prayer is talking to God. Prayer is not get down and shut your eyes and think about your washing or your work you're doing and say, Lord, help me and John, heal Miss Jones and so forth. That's not prayer. That's repeating some words. But prayer is to come into an atmosphere 
where you realize that you're in the presence of God. Hallelujah. And you're moving to them in the deepest of sincerity. Yes. First, it's a worship. Oh, Jehovah, how I love you. Is it? Then after the worship of prayer, then you come with a sincere heart asking, if ye abide in me. Not go out behind the curtains in the world today and run around and try to get back in the curtains tonight. If ye abide in me, my words abide in you. Otherwise, if you're like Aaron's rod that's pulled up to the Shekinah glory by the golden pot of manna where you can eat at any time, and your soul is refreshed and blooming and yielding, abide in me. If ye abide in me, my words abide in you, then ask what you will. It will be given to you. The sea of failures of the church, the Pentecostal church, the Methodists, the Baptists, and all, it's a failing to that abiding grace of God. Tonight you'll shout and clap your hands and dance in the aisles, speak in tongues. That's gifts. Gift is no good unless you're abiding in the Shekinah glory. Those things are fine. I have nothing to say against them. They're of God. Shouting and blessing God, wonderful. Speaking in tongues or translation of tongues or, I mean, interpretation of tongues, it's the same. But, uh, and all these other things, gifts of healing, prophecies, and all these things are marvelous, but they're no good. They're not fruitful. They can't yield. The right, unless you're living in the presence of the Shekinah. That's true. The atmosphere around you is godly. That's the reason that men and women are not permitted to these things. Because you'd go out here and call a blessing over something God had cursed or, or curse something God had blessed. It's a abiding presence to know the will of God. Then don't look what the world's going to say about you. It's what God thinks about you. Then you're living in his presence. In the days of this prophecy, or prophet rather, God has never been without a voice or a mouthpiece somewhere on the earth. And Elijah was his mouthpiece. And as far as I know, during the time of the backslidings of Israel, they always got cold and formal and backslid. Because it goes to show, friends, that here we have no continuing city, but we're seeking one to come. Not long ago I stood and looked. I used to be a pugilist, as you know, fight. I won 15 professional fights, not bragging. I'm ashamed of it. But 15 professional fights without losing a one, nine of them knockouts. Now, I had my picture there when I was in my very best muscles over me and black shaggy hair hanging around my neck. And I looked out, I thought, my little girl come in to see my picture sitting in the room. She said, Daddy, you don't look like you used to. Sure not. For a year, we have no continuing city. This mortal body is fading away. Where it used to be strong, old age, fat begins to slip in. I once remember of a great tree that I used to stand by in its great, skirtly branches. I said it'll live forever, and today it's a snag. I stood not long ago in Rome, where it once ruled the world, and there that great city has now become nothing but you'd have to dig 30 feet under the earth to find the ruins of it. Now one of the weakest degraded nations in the world. They're not even self-supporting. I stood in Athens, Greece, where another great empire once stood. And there's not even hardly a symbol of that empire left. I stood in Cairo, Egypt, where Egypt once known and ruled the world. And the, there are the pharaohs, and there's nothing less but the sinks, and a few of the pyramids are standing as relics 
of a once great worldwide empire. Brother and sister, our great America and our great economy that we have is rotting under the foundations and some days I see it in the making right now. She'll lay in the ruins. And you young men today, you young women, with the beauty of youth, the blush of the young cheeks, the folly of the young heart, but one day will mold you in a graveyard somewhere. Why? Because all mortal has to give away to immortality. Every nation has to fall because there's coming a nation that will not be ruled by man, but by Christ. These things fall. Israel fell. And in its fall, or just before its fall, this great, great prophet raised, which was a fanatic among the people. But he lived in an atmosphere that he was constantly in the presence of God. And he served God away to himself, almost like an isolationist. And I can imagine the people talking about him. I can imagine saying, you believe that story about the bird seeding him up here? You believe all these different things? In the days of Noah, you believe the rain story, how it's going to come water down out of that fanatic. But he lived and entered the atmospheres of God and not of man. And then when it comes time, there was a, the Syrians came over and took a little girl over into their nation and Nahum, the great chief captain of the army, the Bible said he was a mighty man, but he was a leper. Out in these, this world today, right here in Owensboro, Kentucky, there's men of great influence in your city here. I do not know them, but a city of this size could not yield hardly unless it would be a modern Sodom without having men of influence. But it depends on where they let this influence dwell at, what kind of a life it produces. If it's under politics, which I can't say anything about him, we need politics and so forth. But wherever he is, if he lets himself with this influence, lay in the right atmosphere. He ought to lay in the presence of God. Notice, this Naaman was a great fellow, but he was a leper. There's so many people today, even I'm sad to say, but even in the pulpit, this great man. But listen to man's theology instead of staying in the presence of God and still a leper, yeah, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Influential speakers, forceful, but still never knows what it is to be born again to, or to believe in the supernatural and cannot understand it except they come into the kingdom of God. You'll explain it away through reasonings every time. For he's never lived in this atmosphere. But a man ever comes in there, he has to become a son and daughter of God, then his nature is like God's, who believes the supernatural. So they had a little girl there. And I want to show you the force of a testimony of a child who lived in a nation, or perhaps a family who was under the influence of God. She loved her master and her mistress. So when she seen Naaman, probably a good-hearted, good-natured man, as far as we know, according to history, Elijah had never healed a man with leprosy. There had never been a leper case healed in his day. But the little girl, being raised and brought up under the influence over in Israel, yet an alien, she was conducting herself as a believer. And that's the way we should do all the time is conduct ourselves, no matter what our position is, conduct ourselves as believers, ready at all times to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. You see it? 
here some time ago, down in the south, the Germans or the Dutch brought over, the Dutch colonies brought over to America Negroes out of Africa and sold them in the southern states for slaves. And they become personal property to the slave owner. And they work at the toils of the day and their scars over them from whips and sometimes unkind masters. And they were burdened and away from home. Many times they wouldn't want to work and they would make them and force them to work. And on a certain plantation there was a great owner who owned many hundred slaves, two or three hundred slaves on this great plantation. You could buy and swap slaves. And one day a buyer came by. He said, I would like to buy from you that certain slave. Said, I watched him in his conduct. Said, he walked straight. You never have to whip him. Said, he's always willing and standing ready to do anything. He said, he seems to be such a gallant person. Said, perhaps you've made him the boss over the rest of them. He said, no, he's just a slave. Said, maybe you feed him a little better. What makes him act different? Said, no, he eats with the rest of them. Said, what makes him act different? Here it is, brethren. Said, no, I wondered myself what made him always with his chin up, chest out, ready any time. Never droopy, never mopey. Then I learned that he is the son of the king of the tribe. Though he's an alien, though he's away from home, still he conducts himself knowing this, that he's the son of the king. He keeps the morale of the rest of them high. For he knows he's a son. How much that ought to be to the Christian church this morning, and what a challenge! No matter what other men do and what those who profess Christianity does, we must walk as sons and daughters of the King. Yes, Our morale should be wonderful. Yes. We should never act as the world. Or live with the world. We should keep our courage high knowing this, that we are aliens. We don't care about the world and what they think. We are aliens, pilgrims and strangers. But someday we're going home. But at this time, we're pilgrims. This little lady was that time. And she said to her mistress, she said, I would, God, that my Lord Naaman was over in my country, for we have a prophet over there that could heal him of his leprosy. Oh, my. How God used that child. How did she know? The same thing I was talking on last night, inspiration. Sunday atmosphere. Now, notice that child under inspiration was led to say those words. We don't know of Elijah ever healing anyone else, and maybe no one else, no matter how many he prayed for. But she said, I would to God that my Lord was over with my country. For in my country we have a prophet. Oh, if we can say that about our churches today. I would to God that you could come under the influence that I live under and my church lives under, for we believe that God is a healer. We believe that God is a Savior. We believe that God gives the Holy Spirit. And I would to God that you lived in my country. Notice quickly when they entered in a place like that where the supernatural is introduced, Nahum at once sent to his king, and he wrote a letter over to the other king. He said, surely now 
if there's a great thing like that going on over there in that country, the king should know about it. If there is a prophet in the land, the king would know about it. Sure, the high up should know about it. See, that's still the carnal mind. The little girl never said a word about the king. She spoke about the prophet. Yeah, amen. amen. Oh, I hope you see it. <laughs> she spoke of the prophet. Maybe she never seen a case of leprosy healed, but she know where someone lives under that atmosphere of the supernatural. But if he is over there, something would take place. But here goes the king on a roundabout way, or Naaman, going through the king. And the day you speak, it's a I belong to the church. Oh, my. That has nothing to do with the atmosphere. Not a thing. Notice. And he brings the letter over to the king of Israel. And looks like today, if there was a prophet in the land, if there was healing in the land, that the up and ups would know it. God doesn't always deal with the up and ups. We are an individual kingdom. Speaking to someone the other day about polygamy, I said the nation the whole would be better off if it practiced polygamy. It would. We are the highest rated nation in the world with divorces. Marrying and intermarrying, marrying and intermarrying, because we've tried to make the man of the world outside coincide with Christian doctrine, and you can't put the nature of a lamb in a pig. Pligny would be better off for him. Too many, I believe, it, but God would look at Pligny and excuse it a lot quicker than what he would. Now, I remember, don't you said, I believe in Pligny. I don't. Our rims of God said, Moses said, or the Pharisee said to Jesus, said, why did Moses suffer writing your divorce? He said, he did it because of the hardness of your heart. Right. But it wasn't so from the beginning. Never will be. God did it because of the hardness of their heart. But in the nations where they have polygamy, their divorce courts are at ebb, right low. But in here where we're trying to make and govern this country as a nation because being a Christian nation, but the name of Christian nation doesn't make it a Christian nation. And you cannot govern the world by the rules of God. You can't. I have no nothing against the sinner drinking. I have nothing against the sinner committing adultery. Nothing against the sinner doing this. But what I'm talking about is these people who are supposed to be Christians and then doing that. If the pig wants to stick his snout in the manure pile and eat all day, that's his business. Because he's a pig to begin with. But the lamb doesn't do that. The sinner, he's a pig to begin with. But then when you try to make a lamb out of a pig, he has to have a conversion. And he has to come into a different atmosphere. And when he comes into the atmosphere, his desires will change and his nature will change. That's the way it is today. So he goes to the king and has a letter. This letter, baby. I just don't like it. Now, the Baptist church, the people say, anybody want to come in by profession or bring your letter or the change of a letter, remove a letter. Pack it from one church to the other. Just about as much influence in it as there is in this king name, to, or taking this king of Israel, his letter. What's that got to do with God? God isn't going to come to the church and look up your letter. He's got a book in heaven called the book of life. And if your name's not on this book of life, you're lost if you got a letter in every church in the world. Right. And your name will never be written there unless you come into that atmosphere of living and loving with God. God is a loving God. He wants to be loved. You can't be cold, cruel, and indifferent and ever get anywhere with God. You've got to be loving and kind. Notice, and this little lady, she had told him to go to the prophet, but instead of the prophet, he went over to the king. And the king didn't know nothing about divine healing. He didn't know anything about certain, certain things. 
Well, he didn't know that there was a prophet in the land that could perform miracles. He didn't know nothing about it, though he was supposed to be an Israelite circumcised. But to see his atmosphere wasn't like Elijah's atmosphere. And when he got this letter, he reached and got his garments and tore them up and said, Am I God to make man alive or to kill? He said, I want all of you his cabinet. I want all of you to take notice. This man's picking a quarrel with me. You see it? To the world and only tears him up. See, he didn't live under the... Yet he was a professed Israelite. But he thought the days of miracles was past. But oh, thank God. There was an old prophet lived out there in the wilderness who lived with God under a different atmosphere. He heard the king tore his clothes up. He said, why did you tear your clothes up? Say, why didn't you send him out here to me? And he didn't know whether there was a prophet in Israel or not. The king didn't know it. There's many people today that doesn't know that Jesus Christ is still alive. They don't know that He still rules and reigns. They don't know that the blood of Calvary for the, for the all-sufficient... See, that he, he was purchased there at the cross for your transgressions and for your healing. They don't know that's real today. We need some more little maids to go around and testify of these things. Don't you think so? Get in the atmosphere of it. It's not afraid what the world says because while they're talking with the world, they're still in another atmosphere. You're talking to the sinner, but you're not in his atmosphere. And you're in such a glorious and shrouded in them Shekinah glory all around you, the veils of the world hid. You can talk to the worldly women or the worldly man or whoever it is and still live in that Shekinah glory telling of a loving God that's raised from the dead. A few weeks ago, I was in Karlsruhe, Germany. The church down there, which is a, from Swingley, not a Lutheran. But they had, I went in, Billy Graham was there one night at Zurich, and I went in the next day. And my advertisement and Billy Graham's was setting together. Billy Graham has a place in my heart as a true servant of God. He preaches repentance, and he's doing a very fine job at it. God is using him. We know that. And he was had a meeting there, and that day I didn't get to the meeting, though I had an invitation to come set in the, the box. But I was so tired and worn from a long flight around the country for several thousands of miles in the plains, I was wore out. And I went into the room, and I went in to lie down, and I... I went to sleep, and it was too late, so I reached over and turned the radio on, and I heard him preaching through the translator. And the next morning when the newspapers come, I seen what a raking they give Billy Graham. The church denied the main body of church they ever invited such a person to their nation. And they said that he put a manicure in his hair, what is, or, or waved it, you know, what did she call it? Um, permanent, it is. Permanent it in his hair. And he said when he come to the platform to preach, he looked like he was going to a bandbox instead of a servant of God going to not a wrinkle in his clothes. And they said that when he was preaching that he screamed and waved his arms like a fantastic soap salesman from America and said his perfume was so great that you could smell him ten feet away. He preached on the supreme deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I knew what I was in for then. <laughs> well, I had ten days there. Uh, see, the church in Zurich in Switzerland and Germany does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They say he's the Son of Joseph called the Son of God. That knocks the very foundation from under Christianity. Yes. He was a virgin-born Son of the living God. Amen. And Billy Graham never held any strings. He preached it that way. Yes, sir. And I knew I'd follow right up behind him. And in there, God gave us in that ungodly place of a morning. You'd think the millennium had struck there, the chimes and bells on the churches. And yet, they called Billy Graham a soap salesman and me a soothsayer. 
you can know what kind of an atmosphere they're living in. John went forth preaching repentance. Laying the axe to the root of the tree, he did no miracles. Jesus come behind him, not preaching, but healing the sick and performing miracles. And they said if they called him who come, John said he had a devil because he didn't eat and drink the Son of Man, a gluttonous and a friend of sinners. Wisdom is justified of her children. And today, to see in their own country Jesus Christ coming forth and John as a prophet like John, Billy Graham preaching repentance, and then come back around in an old-fashioned campaign to heal the sick and prophecy and all the different signs and wonders, it's still the same ungodly Pharisee spirit that lives out under a church atmosphere instead of under the Shekinah glory. Amen. God forgive me if I say something wrong. You see what I mean? They don't believe. We moved on up into Carl through after having 50,000 of those coal formal people kneel at an altar and give their heart to God and receive the Holy Ghost. Moved on up into Carl's through and the church sent word up there right quick. Don't let him come up there. See? Don't permit it. And they couldn't find any stadiums and things, so the man got together and built a place to cover several acres of ground and spread canvas over it like a big cathedral. And thousands times thousands poured in there the first night. Because they count as many as 180 and 200 buses every night from Germany and from Belgium and all around coming into the Zurich meeting. And when we were went up there, quickly they said, Dr. Guggenbuehl, my representative there, went up there and he said, No! The police said he cannot come. Said, You had Billy Graham. What about him? We have orders not to receive him from the church. And church controls state too, if you under in, Zurich, in Switzerland or Germany, either one. Church and state's together. The church is over the state. And church and state united. So they couldn't do it. Dr. Guggenbuehl went out and he said, God, it can't be so. You led Brother Branham up here, and he wouldn't have come unless you led him. So there's got to be something happening, God. And I was off resting. I said, yes, the Lord speaks to me to go to Germany. And he said, God, something's wrong. It seemed like living in that atmosphere, not a vision, not a voice, but something down his soul said, this is an American zone. Go down to the American headquarters. And he went in there to the major. And the major, he went in and said, Major, I'm Dr. Guggenbuehl from Missouri, Switzerland, which is an attorney which has nationwide publicity and, and loyalty to the nation. He said, and we have a brother from America comes over here to preach for us and said, we have built a great cathedral out here for him. And said, up at Hamburg... We was going to have it in the stadium, but the weather's too rainy, and we had to put this place up here, Carl's Rue, which means Carl's Rest. And he said, we, we have brought him over here now, and he feels that he should come here, and the church has denied us the privilege of letting our brother come. So they had Billy Graham up here and said they let him come. Now what's wrong with our brother coming? He said, well, I think if they let Mr. Graham come, they ought to let your brother come. And, of course, that's American control, you know. So he said, well, I'll tell you. He said, they won't let him come. He said, what do they have against your, your preacher for coming? He said, why do, they, why do they don't want him to come? He said, kind sir. He said, here's the reason. He said, because that our brother prays for the sick and gets a result, and they're against the supernatural of God. He said, what's your brother's name? He said, Brother Branham. He said, Brother Branham. He said, he prayed for my mother, and she was taken from a wheelchair in Virginia. So I tell him it's open. Come on. Not only that, but the army camp will turn loose and we'll come. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Hallelujah. God's still on the throne. Yeah. What you feel is your leading move to it. Yeah. Get in the atmosphere and follow the way that moves. If it goes yeah. east or west, move. Yeah. The first night, a bunch of communists got on the outside other place, and they was routed in the bushes with guns to shoot me, they said. When he went out, German soldiers pledging their loyalty come around and held their arms over me and around around me till they got in the car. One almost got my son, Billy, before he got to the car. A fanatic. And the next night, standing in the building, there were the Holy Spirit moving. I couldn't even call the German names to the people in the audience. I had to spell it out and tell them they seen the work. And 
There sat a medium sitting over there with his eyes cast on me. He said, I'll come down and said, I'll make him to know. He told him that day, he said, I'll call a storm out of the skies. And he said, I'll cause it to tear that place down. And the thunders are roaring, the lightning are flashing as hard as it could. And here it comes. And he made his threats and wrote it out. And I was turning there. It didn't, it didn't matter to me what he said. And when I seen the storm coming and people getting nervous and one constant roar, lightning at the other and like that, I looked around and I seen where he was sitting. I said, you child of the devil. You may be able to perform miracles, that's right. And I've exposed you here. I said, the Bible said, as Jambres and Jambres withstood Moses, so will these, the Antichrist having power to perform miracles. But you're afraid to touch the supernatural of God. Right. I said, because you've done this, you'll pay for it. They packed him out that night as a cripple. And while we were there in a storm going on, I just continued with my message. I kept calling to God in my heart. And after a while, in about ten minutes, the storm cleared away and she began to shine out real pretty. The Lord Jesus! Wow! The people got into the atmosphere when they seen the glory of God begin to move. At that time, they started the prayer line. And they were down there lifting the people to the platform coming. And I shall never forget this. As they lifted a, a little girl to the platform, I never noticed her. I was talking to my interpreter, which was a good one that night, American-born German. And I turned around and I said, Sir, just look here. I said, The stars are bright. Not one arm. And I said, Look at him the way he looks down there now. Saying with his head down, his hands like that. I said, Something's happened to him. And about that time, look around. And somebody began to scream, and I wonder what. And it said a little girl about this high, cute little German girl, her little plaits hanging down her back. And let me tell you, we Americans, we clashed Germany and got the wrong impression. The real born-again children of Germany is just as sweet and dear as any children there is anywhere. A minister told me, he said, I was detailed to do a reconnaissance. And said, I run up to the top of the hill, and they told me, Life or death, you have to go anyhow to break up that machine gun nest. And said, It had ceased firing for a while. He put his arms around me, a German preacher, which was a Nazi in the army, not the SS troop now, you soldiers, but this was just a, 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 a German soldier. And he was detailed, and he had to do it to do this reconnaissance. And when he got up there, I said, I looked over there, Brother Branham. I peeped up over the hill, expecting to be shot out any minute. Said, You know what I found? A bunch of American boys in this machine gun nest with an open Bible on their knees praying. Glory to God. Said, I know they'd throw hand grenades as soon as those 88 millimeter guns got trained in there. They'd blow them up. Said, I picked up my rifle and bang, 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 up in the air. Run back real quick. Said, I don't know whether I got them or not. And they moved the machine gun nest. Pray! Like soldiers see that way about one another. What will the blood of Jesus Christ will cease all wars forever when men and women can ever come into the atmosphere and nation into the environment of the living and resurrected God? That man sitting on a pulpit with me after the service, we had a little lunch together with our arms around one another. There, American with me, who was a soldier in them a few years before, under political influence, would be shooting at one another here with their arms around one another under another influence. That makes man brothers. It's your influence. That night when this little German girl, her little dress on, her little white teeth, I never noticed her. I heard them screaming. I had to turn this way. And nobody was trying to direct her. In that country... They had to get a man who could speak their language to give out their prayer cards. And so he wasn't very well trained, and he let the little girls go to walk off. He just pitched her up there on the platform. She was about the third or the fourth one on the platform. And I looked, she was near the edge of the platform, which is much higher than the ceiling. went up several steps to get to it. And when I looked, she was, I reached and grabbed her like that, and the interpreter began to talk to her. And she was mumbling off something she said, I want to meet the man that's going to pray for me. Little blind thing. And he, the interpreter said, That's him that's got a hold of you. And she moved her little hands. By the way, I had on this same suit was given to me about six years ago in Oslo. So she put her little arms around me like this. 
and laid her little head over on my shoulder. I thought like my little Becky. I stroked her little long plaits like that, and I thought, poor little thing. I heard her snubbing like a child on my bosom. I raised her little head up, and her eyes looked white. Looking at her little face as she was laying back like that on my arm. There, by the grace of God, I saw a vision come forth. The little girl, I seen her laying in a mother's arms, and a doctor looking at her said she was blind from birth. Tall, thin mother with blonde hair. I seen her father, a short, heavy set man with dark hair, where they were at and was speaking the vision. And the mother was setting out the audience and the father way back under many times, thousands and thousands and thousands of people sitting back there. And when I looked back, I said, now, of course, I have no power. What was it? It was atmosphere. It was Shekinah was the one that was giving this thing. Now I looked and I seen the little girl going like a shadow out of this little girl going walking along with her hands up looking around and talking and pointing to things, I knew that the God of heaven lived and reigned. Pulled her over on me and prayed for her, raised her up, and she's looking up at me in her little eyes, staring and sparkling. She mumbled off something, and the translator looked down. He said, Brother Brenham, she can see. I said, keep it to yourself just a minute. I said, what's she saying? She said, she's asking what them, them things are there. It was light. And when the translator, her, she was close enough to her mother, heard the voice and the rest of them, and she looked up and she began weeping out loud. And her mother, so excited, the influence that took over the building. The whole thing was under a heavenly influence. The devil was paralyzed. The influence... And the mother let out a scream and run so fast till she ran out of her shoes. They flew up behind her. She rushed to the platform. She threw her arms around the child. And the child said, Are you my mother? The first time she'd seen her, said, Oh, mother, you're so beautiful. You're so beautiful, mother. The next morning, Almighty God, by His infant power, when the German church come down and said, we can understand and believe your theology and your Bible teaching is wonderful, Brother Branham. But said that lie, that angel, we can't understand it. And they had a breakfast of about 600 ministers met together. And they put a big German camera there. And the Holy Ghost in that same pillar of fire came down and was tucked on the German camera three times that morning. And it swept Germany. The atmosphere changed. That's right. Wish I thought and brought it with me. It's in the Christian businessman this month, or a couple months ago, rather. What is it? It's atmosphere. Men and women should live under that atmosphere. Don't get out from under some normal uh, world existing influence, but stay under the atmosphere of the Lord Jesus. Shall we bow our heads just a moment while we're in His presence? Every man and woman with their head bowed, boys and girls. Turn that little lever that sits right at the top of the brain cell. Bypass all those reasonings out through your ears as nonsense. Then open up that little valve that runs down to the human heart, to your soul. It won't reason. It'll believe. It'll say God's Word is right. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am so thankful this morning to bring to you in your presence not a historical Moses, not a historical Elijah, not a historical God, but a resurrected God. One who died in the only purpose when he was made flesh here, God himself become flesh to take away sin and to make it possible that his Holy Spirit could come into human heart. The historical God is with you today in the presence of the Lord Jesus. 
If you have a need, speak to him now while we pray. Great Jehovah God, who lived before there was an eternity, you was without father, without mother, without beginning of days or ending of years. And reading up on the pages of this sacred book, how the things that you did in the days of yore that's passed by. And to have the privilege of living in this dark age just here at the end of the world. And seeing you rise on the scene again. No guessing. No man-made theology. No cold atmosphere of just joining a church or signing a paper, but living in the Shekinah glory and the influence of a resurrected Lord Jesus, confirming, fulfilling His Word, bringing to pass everything that He said. Merciful Father, I present this audience to you today, that you, you in your great kindness at this hour, will do for this audience that which they have need of. Save the sinner. Call back to repentance the backslider. Heal the sick. Give experience to those who need you, Lord, in that type of an experience. While I ask this audience, Father, to wait on thee, may your Spirit sweep over the audience and give to them individually what they have need of. And while we stay shut in with him who raised from the dead, we ask God the Father in the name of Jesus, his Son, who said, if you ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. And this is not a myth. Neither is this for man's glory. This is for your glory, and that you might raise up little maids and little boys and girls and this community that could tell the sick and afflicted there is a bomb in Gilead. Grant it, Father, for Jesus' sake, while you sit with your heads bowed. If you are sick, look to him now for your healing. If you need salvation, look to him now for salvation. While we stayed shut in with God, I wonder if Pastor would continue on leading in prayer.